Welcome, and thanks for joining me for this first episode of Cleaning Up. I was sat here during the COVID lockdown, thinking of all the extraordinary people that I've met over nearly two decades working in clean energy, clean transportation, climate finance, sustainable development, and thinking how wonderful it would be to be able to catch up with those people, but also to share some of their wisdom, some of their knowledge, some of their leadership lessons with a wider audience. This is a great range of people, people from policy, people from business, investors, civic society. They're people at the top of their game. They've become great, great friends. They're also great fun. So what we're going to do is get a beverage, maybe a beer, maybe a cup of tea, and we're going to chat. We're going to talk about their journey as they've worked on the climate transition and all the associated sectors. And then we're going to share that with you so that you can also enjoy the conversation with these extraordinary people. So without further ado, I'm going to get myself a beer and we're going to get started with the very first episode of Cleaning Up. Our first guest is an old friend of mine, Professor Cameron Hepburn. I'll give you his official bio. He's a professor of environmental economics at University of Oxford, director of the Smith School, publishes about 500 interdisciplinary research papers each year on enterprise and the environment. Not just uh, Cameron, that's the whole school, but I, 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 uh, I know he's involved in quite a few of them. He also serves as director of the Economics of Sustainability Program at the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School. He's got degrees in law and engineering from Melbourne University. I'm sorry to say he is an Aussie. Uh, and um, he's also got a master's and doctorate in economics from Oxford, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. So he's a clever guy. He's co-founded three businesses, has provided advice on energy and environmental policy to government ministers in China, India, UK and Australia and to international institutions, including the OECD and the UN. Uh, now, the unofficial part of it is that he's also a reasonably good cyclist. In fact, he's so reasonably good, he's a little bit faster than me, although I blame my bicycle. Let's bring Cameron into the conversation. Hi, Cameron. How are you doing? Good evening, Michael. I'm not too bad. And I think, I think you do need a new bike. We can agree on that to start with. Well, you're very charitable because, uh, you know, you, you beat me up and down these mountains and then you said, oh, I think it's the bicycle. And it's like, well, you took the words out of my mouth. So, listen, thank you very much for agreeing to be the guinea pig on, on uh, coming clean. Um, and um, what we've got is we've got a lot to talk about. I, I, let's see how we go. Um, but I'd like to start with some of the stuff that you've done very recently. Um, we are still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, it looks like in large parts of the world, certainly in Europe, the cases, case numbers are coming down, uh, but certainly in other parts of the world, they're not. And um, already talk has turned to the stimulus, the green stimulus, how we can come out of COVID-19 uh, and also uh, help the transition towards low carbon energy and transportation and a, a climate safe future. So you did a piece of work um, with Nobel Prize winning uh, pr Professor Stieglitz. Um, can you talk us through, because I kind of read it, but I didn't read it all, but talk us through, say, what did it say? Uh, and and you know, what did you do and what did it say? Well, what we, we did, we started out just asking the question, is this going to be good or bad for the environment? Simple question. Turns out um, fiendishly difficult to actually get a handle on. And once you start to think about it, uh, for any length of time, you realize actually the answer to that question is kind of up to us uh, because the stimulus packages, the response, uh, it's a kind of choice variable. And what we choose to do there in large merit, um, in large way determines whether we're going to kind of head down towards a one and a half or a two degree pathway or kiss Paris goodbye. So 
Uh, that was the kind of starting question. And the way we thought to try to get a handle on, on whether we were likely to take climate sensible action was to survey the people closest to the levers of power. So we surveyed 231 uh, officials in central banks or in finance ministries uh, around the world to uh, get their views on 25 different categories of policy. And we created these 25 categories by looking through all of the hundreds of uh, responses to the last financial crisis and kind of bucketed them up and, and then said, so, you know, which of these do you think is overall the good thing? Which of it is going to give you a long run, high economic multiplier? And which of them is quick to deploy? But also, which of them is good or bad for the climate? And so doing that gave us a sense of just whether these officials were particularly concerned about the climate or, or whether or not they were concerned about the climate. Did they see merit in policies that were going to be good for the climate in some sense? And uh, what emerged from that study was, was somewhat reassuring, I'd say, in that the, the policies that were perceived to be good for the climate were also perceived to be good for the economy. Uh, and I say perceived to be because you know these are these are the collected average views of these 231 officials. I have my own views, and they're they're not entirely in sync with the average. But um, but it's the perceptions that matter to determine what actually happens. And so I found that encouraging, uh, and I walked away from that survey thinking you know maybe there is hope of a of a sensible green recovery to this uh, recession that we're in. Hopefully not depression that we're going into. Um, and then within the set of policies, there were five that really stood out for us. So now moving from the descriptive, what do people think, into the normative, what should we do? You know, we, we looked at um, the range of the literature, the evidence on different policies from last time and, uh, and in the past. And it, it seemed to us that there were, there were five that stood out. So one, um, clean infrastructure. So, you know, the, the classic things that you think of when you're cleaning your energy system or, or your economy, energy efficiency of buildings, upgrades, you know, very labor intensive, you know, pays off over long periods of time. Um, natural infrastructure, green spaces, good, good for people and their mental health, but also good for resilience, climate resilience, and in many cases cheaper than building, you know, artificial concrete uh, flood defenses. Um, clean energy R&D, uh, is a key one because actually driving the costs down further just is good for the economy. Uh, and the last one is retraining and education of workers because if you've got a whole lot of people that are unemployed, you know, we're, we're at over 100 million unemployed in India now, over 30 million, I think, getting towards 40 million unemployed in the US, although they've just had some good numbers. So lots of unemployed people. It's a good time to retrain and to gain some new skills. So, so those five were kind of the top five in richer countries and in poorer countries, um, actually rural support type of policies, shifting agricultural patterns and so on, is probably a better bet than, you know, sinking money into scientists uh, in those economies. So, so they were our conclusions. I mean, it's a, it, it's a fascinating and very rich piece of work. I was one of the experts. I was very flattered to be one of the experts. Um, and and like you, you know, I, I look at the results and I think, well, you know, I, I sort of I sort of disagree with with them. Um, but that's which is fine. There's, you know, di sort of difference of opinion is fine. It's OK. Um, uh, but but there was some, I just worry that what you've discovered is that, um, you know, sort of technocratic experts in economics and transition of, and climate and so on, um, they like interventions they think that the things that are good for them are also good for the world, um, and that you know that they've if they like a policy that they've said it is sort of long term good, short term good, fast, good for the climate, and incredibly smart, correlating entirely. And actually, if they don't like a policy, then they say, oh, it's very slow and much too difficult and won't make any difference anyway, uh, and so on. So you know, it, it is, I suppose, you know, welcome to the world of social sciences or, or <laughs> yeah no i mean I, we look we're worried about you know we're, we're social scientists we spend our lives uh critiquing each other and being critiqued for uh, selection bias uh, emitted variable bias other biases and 
um, the you know you can't eliminate bias. What we did in this study, other than the fact that you know it was the 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 invitations came from me, I didn't actually know you were on that list. It was the the, the methodology is in there to determine who was selected. But um, other than the fact that the invitations came from me, there was nothing to suggest that this was a survey about climate change. And then we also did some statistical analysis for this, the sort of thing, exactly what you just suggested. Are people who like green policies more likely to uh, uprate them on the other dimensions? And equally, people who uh, dislike green policies, are they more likely to uh, downrate um, their performance on non-climate dimensions. And that showed um, no significant bias. doesn't mean there was no bias, but no statistically significant bias in, in the group of kind of climate lovers. It showed a very minor directional bias within those who didn't like climate policies. They're more likely to, you know, downrate them. But I, you know, I wouldn't place, but, I wouldn't get too worried about that. But, you know, if I look at the kind of the, there's a sort of two by two matrix, I'm just going to show you that we probably can, we'll link to the study in the, in the show notes, but you can sort of see there's this two by two matrix here. And one dimension is long run multiplier, because obviously it's good to have a big long run impl- uh, impact on the economy. And the other one is climate impact and it's color coded for speed. But you've got liquidity support, which as far as I can see, is just lending lots and lots of money and cash transfers are down here as having a long run uh, multiplier, basically just lending people lots of money and giving cash counts as a multiplier, but building upgrades and uh, green spaces, sorting out the livability of our cities, those sorts of things, um, apparently don't have a long run multiplier. So there's just some real oddities in there, in my, in my view. I don't know. M- maybe I'm wrong. The one that I really liked when I answered the questionnaire was energy efficiency, building upgrades, because uh, to my mind, it's a way of putting money in the hands of a lot of people, craftsmen, tradesmen, uh, very quickly. So it's immediate. Um, it has a short-term multiplier, quite clearly. And also you're upgrading an asset, a building. And so therefore it ought to have uh, a, long to, a long-run multiplier effect as well. Um, so I've sort of argued strongly for uh, building ef- for efficiency, uh, but it doesn't seem to have won through in the study. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Because actually your views are buttressed by the economic literature on this topic, which is very strongly supportive. Uh, and, you know, it's, it, as it happens, it's my view too. Uh, but it, so it tells you something informative that officials around the world aren't necessarily thinking of it in the same light, despite the fact that post-financial crisis last time, 2008-9, there were a number of big energy efficiency programs instituted in a num- you know, number of countries, Australia, US, China, um, US, Canada, for instance. Um, I guess one question is how successful they are in a socially distant way. It's probably not too bad um, compared to other things you might be doing. That's a question to ask. Um, but then, yeah, the nice thing about it, as you say, is that you, you, you use a lot of spare labor now. It's not particularly high skilled labor. It's not as if you need to study for 10 years and get a doctorate before you can start installing insulation bats. You do need some training, but that's, that's not, not too onerous. And you know, you, we know from past experience you can get going pretty quickly. So it is, it is one of the five areas that actually in our kind of more normative recommendations we, we suggest prioritizing. And that's like, it's interesting that you say that, that um, officials don't seem to have kind of grasped it. But actually, if you look at um, the UK preparation for COP26, there's a big stream around energy efficiency, uh, product efficiency, but also um, in the built environment, um, but also the European Green Deal. Um, they've got this 90 billion euro, by far the biggest chunk, by far, probably more than half, is actually their uh, renovation I don't know quite what they call it. The renovation is not really a fund, but the renovation um, bucket, let's call it a bucket of what they're doing, um, which would suggest that perhaps the policymakers are ahead of the respondents to the questionnaires. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, uh, we, all we can um, draw conclusions from are the, uh, the aggregate of average views of yeah. 231 respondents. I mean, they're global. So, you know, you're getting a number of responses from... Yeah, the African continent, from the Americas, from Asia as well in here. And I dare say there's probably a a mix of views prioritizing buildings efficiency from one location uh, to another. So that might be part of it. Maybe the Europeans are going harder at this now at this point. Uh, But, yeah, look, there are some there are definitely some 
aggregate answers in there with which I, I wouldn't share. The, the well, I'm going to keep banging the drum for energy efficiency because I think anybody who's looked at uh, the challenge of 2030 uh, and what has to happen to emissions between now and 2030, in fact, obviously out till, uh, till 2040, 2050 and beyond, you can't get there with just uh, supply side clean energy, renewable energy, even uh, if you add in nuclear. Uh, we've got to, you know, we've got to move the needle, we've got to bend the arc on energy efficiency. So I'm going to be um, banging the drum there. Um, but I want to move on to some other stuff that you've worked on um, that I'm extremely, you know, that I've been, I've been very supportive and I've followed in, in um, uh, quite some detail, which is the restatement or the attempt to get national accounts restated. So the, you, you edited a book in 2017 with Kirk Hamilton, which was called National Wealth, What is Missing and Why It Matters. Um, so what is mit- missing and why does it matter? I guess the answer, you know, go and read the book is is not adequate. But <laughs> it's, it's it's actually it's a long book and it's uh it's it's not for somebody who doesn't want the details. It's an academic text. But um, but the the short the short answer for this kind of discussion is discussion is that in many national accounts, not all, uh, natural capital is missing. Uh, you know, one of the most central of our capitals just isn't isn't in the accounts. So and if, explain because. This is the first one of these uh, coming clean uh, shows, and I have no idea who's going to watch it, if anybody. So explain what you mean by natural capital. I mean, a national account, just assume that, that assume that I know nothing. You won't be far from the truth, but assume the audience uh, is similarly needing a, a, some basic uh, terminology. Sure. Well, I mean, economists typically have thought of the world as being uh, divided into two factors of production. You use capital and you use labor. And then you produce stuff. Uh, but as I think it was probably Herman Daly famously said once, you know, you can't make a cake with a chef and an oven. You need the eggs and the flour as well. So you, you need the raw inputs. I mean, the material inputs are essential too. So natural capital includes all of the, the, the raw environmental inputs, whether it's coal, oil and gas, actually. They're all part of natural capital, believe it or not or uh, our food system, but also the ecosystems that enable us to breathe and uh, to go about our business happily. So you know, the, the, everything nature provides to us is, is natural capital. And in, um, in some countries, it is now being accounted for pretty well. So you know, the UK is increasingly doing a very good job on this. Australia, Canada, two other nations where you know, their, their equivalents, the office of national statistics or, or the, the bureaus uh, are drawing up fairly detailed uh, national accounts that capture natural capital. And I think the reason those countries are interested in it, I mean, if you're Australia or Canada, then you're very aware of the mineral wealth of the nation because it's very big, including the fossil wealth of the nation. And, and once you're there, you, it's, it's a small step to start to think about the ecosystem wealth and the agricultural uh, wealth of the nation. So, so that's a big element that's, um, if not missing, they're not uh, accurately uh, and comprehensively accounted for. But there are other capitals that we don't, you know, economists just haven't really grasped because it's hard. You, you know, I mean, it's not, it's not a kind of critique of the economics profession. It's so just really Economists difficult. like doing easy things. Well, everyone <laughs> likes doing easy things, let's, let's face it. And what are the other ones? What are the other well, capitals? A, a very important uh, capital that, that is very difficult to, to account for and to price, but we know it's vital, is, is the social capital of the nation. So this includes things like how much do we trust one another? You know, if I go into a, in, into a classroom, what's the odds of a student pulling a gun on me? Because if the odds of that are very high, then I'm not going to be teaching. I mean, maybe I'll do it digitally. But, you know, so, so if, if, you're in a, if, if you're in a society where trust levels are really high, in each other and in public institutions, then it's no surprise that you can do lots of deals because you know, you're not gonna trust the other person to shaft you. And with more deals comes more economic activity. You've got the rule of law working. You know that if somebody does something wrong, you can take them to courts and you've got a functioning legal system. All these sorts of things enable economic output. They're kind of key inputs into the production process. And that's hard to measure, but it's vital because without those things, you've got a failed state and you've got no economy. 
Right. And then you've, you've got some other ones in there. You've got infrastructure, you've got human capital. I, th- I mean, I'm, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to uh, maybe run ahead of, of your explanation. Um, but also, where's intellectual capital, intellectual property, um, the, just the shared knowledge that you've got in, in an economy, the patents, but also the know-how? Uh, is that, you know, is that in there as well? Yeah, it's another one of these capitals that is unfortunately too often missing from the accounts. Uh, and the tricky thing about um, you know knowledge capital is that it, it splits into two forms. There's uh, knowledge that is embodied in humans, uh, and there's knowledge that you know if 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 we wipe out all of the humans, it's still a, not that you would do that, but it's still in the records. So there's, there's this disembodied. Okay, knowledge. so how do you disaggregate it from the value of your humans? Yeah, right. Because isn't this fundamentally about saying, well, we really want to be using a nation's balance sheet as a measure of how we're doing and not GDP, which is just kind of some some you know transactional activity. GDP gets a bit of a bad rap, in my view. I think that one of the things with COVID that um, has woken us up is that jobs matter. And GDP seems to be quite a good measure of uh, of jobs. So a lot of a lot of the kind of recent, you know, we've really got to move away completely from GDP seems to me to ignore the jobs piece. But other than that, um, the asset side, kind of a balance, a national balance sheet seems more sensible. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit like this kind of uh, debate sometimes really needs to be better informed because it's it's people looking at an orange and getting really upset that the orange isn't an apple. You know, it's just an orange. Once you understand it's an orange, you're fine with it. And, and GDP isn't an apple, it's an orange. And what it does is measure the market-based economic output of the nation. That's what it measures. There's nothing wrong with that. It's a very useful indicator because it correlates with things like employment uh, and many other economic variables of interest. It's not a measure of well-being. It's not even a measure of uh, material prosperity. And it's not a measure of the wealth of the nation because I'm but, sure but it what- is the measure that we obsess about. I mean, we talk about recession incessantly as though that last, you know, 0.5% growth or not growth, you know, is the difference between national success, national failure, human well being, human misery, and so on. Um, so you're saying that we've wasted acres of newsprint. Well, I think, um, so I agree with you, there's nothing wrong with GDP, but I would say that you need, look, put it this way, it's a bit like if you're running a company, you, you look at the P&L, sure, but, but you also look at the balance sheet. You know, every company has to have both and you can't properly run the company without both. And in a sense, it's scandalous that we attempt to run our countries, you know, our entire nations without having a proper picture of the balance sheet of the nation. What are our stocks of assets? Are they going up? Are they going down? Not just was this year a good year or a bad year. So, you know, I, I'm not I'm not critiquing GDP. I'm so, saying let's have both. Okay, so I agree with you entirely what you said. I think it's absolutely scandalous. It's ridiculous that we, you know, we fetishize this this single metric GDP of activity, but don't look at whether we've got, you know, more more forests, more miles of motorway in good condition, more patents, more teachers, more of all the good things uh, in life, more, more, more fine wines laid down for future generations, et cetera, et cetera. So it's absurd. But the, the thing that troubles me is what is the th- how do you get society, how do you get the Daily Mail to focus on that kind of asset side, even partially, even if you say, okay, well, you know, you can kind of use both. The fact is they're going to use one metric and if it isn't, you know, if it isn't GDP and it's going to be some kind of measure of national wealth, I mean, that's that's your thing, right? How do you get them to focus on that? How do you get society to say, actually, I care much more about the value of everything around me because that's what drives well-being and happiness and medical care and all the good things and not just this stupid measure of activity? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, you've got to attack on both sides. Like any entrepreneurial dilemma, uh, if you want to change things, you've got to get both sides moving. So there's a demand for this and a supply of it. And the supply is from the offices of national statistics. It's arguably not that sexy. The Daily Mail isn't going to go in there undercover and work out what the – well, maybe one day they will. That's a sign of success. Uh, but And on the demand side, it's getting public figures and politicians – asking the question. I mean, I'd love to have a leader of the opposition uh, and maybe 
you know, in the UK, Keir Starmer, who is an Oxford grad, of course, could ask that other Oxford grad who's running the country why it is that the nation's wealth has declined in recent years. I mean, assuming it has, we've got to check the books. But, um, you know, is natural capital on the way down or up? Is human capital on the way down if we're losing skills and capabilities in the country? And that's a more interesting question than GDP only rose by 1% last year. No, I, I agree with you. I think, I, I mean, it's a, but it is a, it's a huge challenge because, of course, some of the things that you listed there, you know, social capital, how the hell do you measure it? You know, one person, one person saying, you know, we've got, um, uh, we've got tight control of our population with fantastic surveillance. They can't move without the, the government knows about it. And therefore, we have fabulous social capital. And somebody else might look at that and say, I'm going to put a line through that balance sheet item. I think you're doing it the wrong way. It's oppressive. It, you, it's dictatorial, and I don't call that social capital. I call a bit of chaos social capital because countries that muddle through and are used to chaos um, perhaps uh, have more resilience. I mean, it, it, how on earth do you quantify which one is doing better? Yeah, look, it's, it's hard, and you know, I'm the first to, to say that. So, and, uh, luckily for me, it's not the thing I spend my time trying to do. I leave that to better economists than, than me. But what I would say is that... Um, it's not an impossible task to do this roughly right. And, you know, you don't have to be perfect to be better than what is the implicit value, which is zero, which is currently in the accounts. And the reason you can be roughly right about things is that you can do a bit of triangulation here. So you can get a sense roughly of what the aggregate wealth of the nation is. And then you can look at, you can do the bits from the bottom up and add them up and say, well, does that roughly match with our estimate from the top down? And you know, it doesn't. You know, the, the, the numbers are out by a bit. You can start to work out, well, where are we going wrong? And the point is, at, at, at some stage, you think, okay, these numbers are wrong. All numbers are wrong. By the way, GDP is wrong too. And there's, there's estimates, there's dodgy stuff in the calculation of GDP, left, right, and center. But at some point, you say, well, it's more useful to have this number than it is not to have the number. So we'll start to try and work on it, and we'll improve it as we go along. And where, where do you get the value for infrastructure? Where do you get the asset value? for? I mean, is that taken out of sort of all of the accounts of all companies and entities that own infrastructure? Well, um, that's, in a sense, it's an easier number than, than many of the others because produced capital, which is what that's part of, the, the kind of physical produced capital, human produced capital of the nation, uh, has, has asset values on it. Um, yeah, yeah, you, know, you, you, you can question. get into the bowels of do you use a regulatory asset base approach? Do you do the discount and net present value of the future stream of social benefits of the piece of infrastructure? You know, in theory, what you're looking for is is the discounted future value of the shadow value of that infrastructure over the lifetime of its use. Yeah. I guess the more we talk about it, I'm just sort of filled with, you know, in a sense, objections, even though I approve of this. This is, this is I think, the right thing. But maybe it's just kind of, maybe I'm just getting sucked into the vortex of, of uh, you know, your, your next, next thing I'll be doing is applying for, you know, to do a PhD at the Smith School so I can really drill down. But, you know, I was on the board of Transport for London and the balance sheet showed um, that TfL's uh, entire asset base was £24 billion pounds. 24 billion pounds. I mean, we were spending, whatever, at the time we thought we were spending 15 or 16 on Crossrail 2. It turns out that it was 18 or 19. Um, uh, but, but you know, that's just for one line. And then the whole of everything else was supposed to be worth 24. And of course, the replacement value or the net present value of fair income or something would be way bigger than 24 billion. I mean, the replacement value of, of London Underground must be hundreds of billions if you really tried to build it. Yeah, and in principle, what you're looking for with these calculations is the full social value of the asset, uh, not the value to any particular owner. Or so you know, I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised if the TfL numbers weren't uh, used by ONS in some form, which tells yeah. you immediately that you've probably that, got, an, in your view that, at least, an underestimate. That's what worry. That's what worries me. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. But um, okay. yeah, better something than zero. Let's move on, because as I say, you know, I can raise endless objections, but actually I really like the work. And um, and I, I don't know whether you're going to be updating um, or, or, or um, 
you know, doing more on national wealth. But I do hope so, because it is such an important transition. I agree. Um, it's to- extremely important, which is why we, we, we put the book together. But I really what I want to have happen is that for the statisticians to spend their time dealing with objections right. like yours. And, and to I'll answer my on. questions, but not you. OK, um, well, let's move on, because lots and lots of your work, you could almost say the sort of the, the cent- central focus of your work is around climate change, at least. If I look at your list of publications, whether they're on sort of China or or the West or on, uh, uh, you know, the, it could be around, you know, you'd probably say, well, it's sustainability more broadly, but climate change is very much at the centre of it. Um, where do we stand? You've, you know, because you, you, you've got lots of touch points, everything from the fact that you like biking around mountains to knowing the statistics and, you know, probably as much of the theory and the uh, costs, the sort of stern review costs uh, and also the energy trends, you, you know, as much as uh, uh, far more than me and as much as anybody I know. I mean, are we are we really in trouble or are we are we winning? Are we losing? Where are we? I, I feel like saying we're winning and losing at the same time. So, I mean, we're losing in the sense that the. Um you know, emissions were not for the virus, were still heading up, not as fast as they had been in the past. Uh, as you know, we're kind of at, at 40 gigatons a year all up and um, mid-30s from the energy sector alone, gigatons of CO2 or CO2 equivalents. And, you know, the only thing that that has pulled them down has been the last uh, recession and, and obviously this one. So you can look at that and say, well, you could conclude negatively that while the economy is growing, emissions are growing, and we don't want a shrinking economy, so we're stuffed. And you know, certain of my colleagues do draw those conclusions. So that's the sense in which we're losing. And there's a sense in which, you know, we we really ideally would have got going seriously on this problem 20 or 30 years ago, and we've squandered a lot of time. The sense in which we're winning is that. The, you know, you don't necessarily see it in the aggregate data so far, but it's the points, Michael, you make so powerfully and strongly all the time, which is that the cost of the alternatives to the fossil, dirty, old economy just keep coming down year on year, you know, reliably, incredibly, and, and over decades and decades, you look, at, you look at the long time theories here, and there's no doubt which set of technologies wins in the long run. And actually, the long run is increasingly the short run because, again, for the, we've had 20 or 30 years of this stuff ticking away in the background. So, so we're winning because solar and wind are now cost competitive in many locations a lot of the time. They, they keep on getting cheaper. And you're just not seeing that in, in oil and gas. You had a crash in the oil price, obviously. As- can, can I – let me – this is sort of – embarrassing but it's embarrassing in a good way because i said oh you know these numbers much better than me and uh, but now i'm going to challenge you because you you know that the you you say that you know emissions keep going up but actually in 2019 before covid they didn't go up they were actually flat and they were flat in 2014 and 2015 and 2016 plus or minus 0.1 percent so the last six years they've been flat they went up in 17 and 18 I look at that. Okay, so we've now said that GDP is a rubbish indicator of anything except maybe jobs, but it's a rubbish indicator. But actually, in the last six years, GDP went up by 23%, and emissions only went up by 3%. So you could say, well, yeah, they're still going up, and maybe you stick with your earlier answer. But I think you're being too pessimistic. Well, no, no, I take that point. I mean, they are, um, they're, they're certainly decelerating the, yeah. the increase. That's For absolutely sure. true. And um, and we're, I guess we're rapidly getting into this decoupling debate because, you know, I, um, it's clear to me that we I mean, it's obvious in the data we have been decoupling economic output from emissions over a matter of decades. And the last decades, a, a, a great example. Then where this debate moves on to next is, well, you know, you get this relative decoupling, but can you actually keep on growing your economy and shrink your emissions base? And of course, the answer to that is yes. You know, I mean, I, I think those who who say it can't be done because it hasn't been done before, it just it's a failure of the imagination, really. It doesn't even require that much imagination. It's it's kind of, it's just a projection of where we have been going. So that, that's the sense in which we're winning. You know, if you look backwards, we're kind of losing. And you, if you look at where we are, 
we're losing. But if you look forwards uh, and, you know, not in a naive and kind of stupid way, but based on some of the more fundamental underlying structural shifts in the economy, I think we're winning. Well, so it's very interesting that you say, well, of course, we can absolutely decouple because, I mean, there will be people, I don't know whether they'll watch this, uh, they certainly should, they might learn something, uh, but there will be people who say, uh, you know, they'll be jumping out of their chairs and saying, um, you know, no, it, it's absolutely clear, absolute decoupling is impossible. Uh, I mean, you brought Herman Daly into it uh, earlier. Um, you know, he, his acolytes will be saying it is thermodynamically impossible to have economic growth uh, on a finite plan, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Jason Hickel will be saying, oh, there's much too much stuff that needs to be shifted. Um, you'd have, um, you, you'd have uh, Vaclav Smil saying everything takes 50 years, so you're a fool. Uh, he would say it in a very nice way because he's a charming guy. I'm paraphrasing. Um, you would have uh, people saying, oh, the energy returns on energy invested are, uh, uh, from the technologies, solar and wind that you mentioned, are, are far too low. And of course, only nuclear could possibly achieve this. Uh, and, and so you'd have some people really riled up by your answer. But you're convinced that absolutely we can have, abs we can have absolute decoupling you're, you're, and that yeah, we no, are likely to. I to totally convinced, um, you know, and I, and I know all of those people, if you're watching hi, I mean, they're very nice people. Um, <laughs> in fact, in many cases, very good friends. And so we have these so high schools. You've heard it here. You're nice, but you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. You're, you're great, but you're wrong. And, um, and I think for, for me, at least, this is actually fairly obvious. So one, one point I'll concede immediately, right, which is that you – you, uh, in theory, can have infinite growth in value on a finite planet. That's clearly true. That's not a concession. That's my point. Uh, but the thing I'll concede is that practically, right now as I sit here, it seems pretty difficult to imagine uh, infinite growth forever and ever, right, on a finite planet. Um, but but we don't need to be thinking about 100 million years into the future or you know, 2 billion years into the future or, or even – 20,000 years in the future, if, if humanity gets that far, I'd be really thrilled. Uh, and, and in the course of the next 100, 200, uh, maybe even more years, the, this idea that we're going to come up against some fundamental thermodynamic limit, I think is just misplaced. Uh, and the reason comes, well, there's lots of reasons, but let's take the energy return on energy invested point. Uh, so for, for those of your uh, viewers who aren't familiar with this, this is the idea that it takes a certain amount of energy to build a solar panel. Um, you've got to get some energy out to justify the energy that goes in. And um, the, the claim has been that that amount that you get out is low. You might only get five times as much out as you put in. That was probably 10 years ago. And then it's, oh, maybe you only get 10 times as much. Okay, well, maybe you get 20 or 30. And the point is that as solar panels get more and more efficient and as they get cheaper, you get more energy out compared to the energy you put in. And fundamentally, provided you're getting more than one, I mean, okay, significantly more than one, but, you know, some multiple of one, you're getting more energy out than you're putting in. And then the question is, well, but you have to make the solar panels with fossil fuels because if you've got to make them with fossil fuels, you're stuffed. And, of course, the answer to that is, well, no, in, in due course, I mean, solar will make solar and, and, and we're fine. Yeah. So, you know, I don't, I don't think there's any – so, you know, go back to your thermodynamics. This, this is not a closed um, – uh, system, Michael, you're going to remind me of the the correct term here. No, it's 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 closed because it's closed to matter largely, but it's right. not an isolated system. There you go. It's not an isolated flows system. Through it. That's right. Uh, it, your your engineering is older than mine, but it's accurate. <laughs> um, and uh, and it's we've we've got all these photons beaming in at us. Yeah. Uh, vast yeah. vast quantities no, of yeah. the energy return on energy invested discussion is a fabulous one. Uh, I enraged people on Twitter by pointing out that um, if nuclear produces 60, a return of 60 over 60 years and renewable energy produces a return of 20 over 20 years, those are exactly equivalent because, you know, just saying, well, all we, all we care about is energy return on energy invested is like saying, well, I judge an investment based on the cash return. And I don't care whether it takes 20 years to double or 100 years to double or or 20 minutes to double my investment. And it's, of course, that's not how you choose investments. It's energy return on energy invested per year is what you should be looking at once it's more than one. 
Yeah, and um, and, and I guess for me the slam dunk point is that uh, the the cheapest energy is going to win, even if it has lower energy return on energy yeah. investment. Oh, no, uh, so, so I think look, we're we're furiously agreeing, um, uh, and and I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Actually. Um, what I what I what I'd love to do is kind of get a, a short segment here where we get you on the record for posterity with a few sort of I call it you know this is the sweepstakes round. Um, which which year will peak emissions be? And you're allowed to say 2019 because obviously COVID has taken a big slice out of emissions. Um, and so in, in a way, your answer might encapsulate some thought about what happens in terms of the bounce back after COVID. Uh, well, I'm going to be a pain, Michael, of course, and, and say the premise of your question is a deterministic world where we can uh, specify an answer. And of course, you know, that's not the world we live in. So let me give you a couple of scenarios. Give me a probability distribution function. There you go. That's probably better. <laughs> even, even better would be a number of different probability distributions. So we had some ambiguity around the distribution. Anyway, so I, look, I think um, it's a reasonable bet that 2019 will be the year of peak emissions. And I say that because uh, it's, you know, obviously they're going to be down significantly this year, um, five to 10% down on last year. It's a big drop, depending on, um, you know, who you believe and how it plays out. And then the question is, well, 2021, we will have a bounce back in economic activity that will lead to emissions returning, but it doesn't need to lead to them returning to the level that they're at in 2019. And this is where kind of forecasting becomes, in a, a sense, the wrong paradigm, because these are these are a function of choices that we make. I mean, we can choose with these recovery packages to have emissions lower in 2021 than in 2019. And I think the evidence thus far, you look at the EU and the German package, they're in pretty good shape. The Americans haven't been particularly strong on this as you'd expect, but actually in a way, if there's no big recovery package before the next election, that means whoever is the next prime minister has control of it, a uh, president rather, has control over it. And that could be a good or a bad thing. China, it's all to play for right now. There are some good and bad signs, but but you know, these are these are conditions and choices that we have to make. So it's not a bad bet that 2019 is the peak. If it isn't the peak, it'll be probably because we have failed to take the green recovery seriously. Uh, and in that kind of scenario, you know, you're peaking, you're still peaking within the 2020s, I would say, um, perhaps late 2020s. But, um, you know, but just because of the fundamental structural drivers that we were talking about before of, of cleaner becoming cheaper. Yeah, for what it's worth, I think my answer is 20, it's, it's either 2019 or it's sort of 2024, because I think that in that second scenario, um, I think that the COVID recession is going to take a few years to recover from. So I don't see it as being 2021 or 2022. We've bounced back to the old levels. I think that takes a bit longer. But then these powerful downward downdrafts of um, efficiency, solar, wind, et cetera, et cetera, uh, cut in. And I think, you know, if COVID hadn't come along, I would have probably said 2026, 2027, 2028. But with the with the recession. So I don't know. That. I mean, I think we're probably, we, we could probably split the difference over a, over another beer uh, at some point when COVID is over. Okay. So what about peak oil? Um, I mean, that, that has to be part of peak something at some point, but are we, you know, oh, yeah, and there is, you've now got even Saudi Aramco's IPO document said that they anticipate peak demand for oil in transport to be this side of 2040. Um, what, what do you what do you reckon? You know, if you had to pick a year, if I forced you to choose one, what would it be? Well, um, so we were at roughly a hundred million barrels a day, weren't we, before the crisis, and now we're down to you know ninety or below, I think, on an annualized basis, um, and. Uh, oil demand was still rising before the crisis, I guess. So I take the um, the aviation forecast that I last looked at that seemed plausible to me was that uh, air travel, it's not a huge chunk of oil demand, actually, but the kerosene demand would take five years to recover. I think um, 
land-based transport recover more quickly, but then, you know, by 2030, you start to get, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking aloud here, but I guess I would say, um, I think it's probably, again, I mean, it's not completely impossible that it's 2019, but it's, it's much, uh, you know, it's probably less likely. Uh, and I would say it's probably in the 2030s because you, you know, the simple reason is that it's a much easier job to squeeze your emissions out of your electricity sector because of the cost uh, advantages of renewables than it is to to replace all of your uh, transport with solar and wind or other um, you know, fundamentally solar or wind powered molecules or electrons. So yeah, I think I'm probably in the um, in the 2030s there. Uh, possibly even late 2030s. Again, it depends on depends on your scenarios. These are things that we have some control over. It's kind of for us to yeah. choose. Yes, I, mean, I think that I'm a, I'm probably a 2030. Maybe the, you know maybe if I'm feeling good, I'll say this side of 2030. Otherwise, that side. But it is very hard in transportation because we've just got so much of the supply chain of uh, electric vehicles and the charging, so we've got so much still to build and. There are cars and there are vehicles that just take a long time to cycle through the, the fleet. Yeah, uh, and that's not any, even the big chunk of it. Uh, have you done any work on um, plastics, chemicals? Because, of course, the other piece that people so – it's all very dull to talk about industry, and usually people just say, oh, hydrogen, uh, and, and hope that's the get-out-of-jail-free uh, card. But have you looked at – particularly around biofuels, bioplastics, chemicals? Uh, because that's – you know, a lot of oil companies are saying, well, there'll always be, there'll always be plastics. Um, so we can reorient our business around that, even if the transportation piece goes away or, or is, comes under huge pressure. Yeah, I'm familiar with that, that line. And, I mean, it, there's a sense in which it's not a, a bad line for a while. But uh, to give you an example, we've got a program at Oxford on the future of plastics. Uh, and we've already got technologies that are economic to produce plastics not from barrels of oil. Um, they're, they're far cheaper to produce them from captured CO2, actually, because it's purer, uh, and you don't have to be you know, processing all of the nasties that come up with a, with a barrel of oil. Um, so, I mean, that's, that, these are very niche, high-value uh, products at the moment, but it's not, you know, it's far from inconceivable, and I think it's, you know, it's, virtually bound to be true that before the century is out, uh, we'll have all sorts of different uh, feedstocks for plastics that aren't petrochemicals. Yeah. They'll either be bio or they'll be direct. You know, if we sort out direct air capture at low cost, then you got your carbon from your CO2 molecule that you capture and you got your hydrogen from splitting water, which is all powered from the sun and the wind. And off you go, start building up your hydrocarbons that way. Yeah. Had you, had you said... 2050 rather than the end of the century i would not have been i would not have disagreed i mean it seems to me inconceivable that the best way of getting a big complicated nice molecule hydro, hydrocarbon molecule will be you know sucking brown goo out of the ground and then looking for the big molecule you know rather than just building it uh whether that takes 20 years i don't think it's going to take 80 years i think it's going to take 20 or 30 at the most yeah, well, I mean, I, so you might be right that it's so. Well, look, put it this way, you're certainly right because some of these plastics are already being produced this way yeah. because it's cheaper. So the the question is, how long does it take before you squeeze out all of the petrochemical based plastics from the yeah. global economy? And I, th I think that takes a bit longer. Oh, to, the end point will be after the beginning. That's for sure. Um, okay, good. So I mean, I've got. Um, Emissions from energy in 2030, you said that it would peak before 2030. What do you think they'll reach by, by 2030? Sort of from, let's call it from 2019 down to 2030. What do you reckon? Just for posterity, name a number. Uh, so we're at, um, so emissions from energy. So we're at about 35 billion tons, gigatons a year now. Um, 2030, Again, I'd be thinking about scenarios. Uh, I guess I, I would probably um, not quite on a, I'm certainly not on a one and a half degree scenario. I'm probably around uh, an IEA or an Aurora, uh, <laughs> so, so absolutely, an Aurora uh, two degree kind of scenario, which is probably roughly 25 to, to 30 ish. Uh, oh, gosh. 20. So that's, that is a five out of, that's so. 
uh, about a 12 or 13 to a 25 percent reduction. Yeah, so you might think not huge, but then... Um, no, I think that's absolutely huge. Compared to 2019 um, emissions, I think it's huge. Yeah. So, but that's... that. Yeah, I, th I think that's totally plausible, particularly given that we've just knocked... You know, okay, it's going to come back on again, but we've just um, just knocked 10% off, yeah. off oil. Uh, I'm probably somewhere around 7.5%, maybe 10% down from the, from the 2019 figure. I just can't. I can't. I just think these, there's so much inertia and, and growth in the developing world. Um, and then, um, which year for net zero? Um, so I don't. I mean, so we've just. You know, the UK has got its net zero by 2050 target or com legal commitment, I should say. And you know, we've got a lot of countries in that category now, but these are the leaders. Uh, so for you to be global. By uh, global net zero isn't going to be before 2050 at the current rate. So what could change that? If you had a bunch of really severe climate impacts uh, and generational shift, which of course we will have before then, um, the, the the people with their hands on the levers of power will have grown up with this as an issue and know that action is required, and uh, and the those who just haven't properly understood the science, I think, will be in, in very low numbers. But so, so I'm not ruling global net zero out by 2050, but I'd say it's a very big stretch. I mean, I think probably 2070 uh, is more realistic, which still puts you on a two-ish um, you know, degree world. And I think that's probably where we end up, about two, maybe a bit bit higher, possibly a bit lower. And that depends, up, it, again, depends upon our choices. These are not some... So this is another one where there's going to be people watching it, if anybody is watching it, um, jumping out of their chair and saying, you know, you are condemning the world to this appalling apocalypse of, of two degrees and we have to go for one and a half degrees. There will be other people. I mean, in my book, what you've just said, um, net zero by 2070, uh, you know, well this side of the century, actually makes you an optimist. Um, and, 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 and so, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, well, we're going to be, um, you know, so, something like, uh, what was it? You said five to 10 gigatons emissions down by 2030. We're going to be at net zero by 2070. It's your sort of central scenario, depending on what we do. And, uh, and with all the caveats that I'd have expected from you, um, that's pr pretty optimistic. So, I mean, is that, is that fair? You see, I mean, I, yeah, I know, I know you, you are an optimistic guy. Um, how do you square that with some of the stuff that you see around in the political space? Um, well, I, no, I am an optimistic person by nature. Uh, and certainly, you know, the, the kind of parameters of, you know, you've pinned me on to one particular set of numbers here, which I would prefer to resist. But uh, it's, it's not, for instance, the Aurora Central scenario, which, uh, which is far less optimistic than mine. But so how do I square that with current politics, I think? Um, there's quite a lot to, to be pleased with and optimistic about in the current political environment. As I say, the, the you know, Germany's uh, recovery package is you know, 30 to 40 percent green, depending on how you count. And we'll obviously, we need to study the details. Uh, these are big numbers going into turning the economy around. You've got the uh, IMO commitment, uh, International Maritime Organization on shipping, tremendous Progress in the cost of electrolysis, as Michael, you know, coming out of China, cost reductions there. And we saw yet more records being break, bro broken on, um, on the solar cost side. So I, I, for me, it's these numbers, these cost numbers, which people keep dismissing. You know, like a few years ago, it was, well, we've seen those wind numbers. They're just options. Nobody's actually going to build a wind farm at that price. And, you know, the wind farms get built at that price. Uh, and so, so those kind of cost reductions, 140 pounds a megawatt hour down to 50-ish uh, pounds a megawatt hour, stunning progress. And that's what we're able to do when we put our minds to it. Um, now, I guess you asked about the political environment rather than the scientific and tech environment. And there, yeah, the politics has always moved more slowly, will keep moving more slowly. Um, but actually, politicians are just responding to their voters and public opinion 
is changing helpfully here too. It was changing very strongly before the pandemic. And you've probably seen the YouGov poll showing that, you know, in many countries, it's 80, 70 to 80 percent of the population want a green recovery to this pandemic. Even in, you know, countries like the States, which not been particularly pro action on the climate change in the last few years, it's a comfortable majority who want a green recovery. So, so I take some uh, pleasure in those numbers. And so what, what keeps you up at night? I mean, what, what, you know, do you, or do, does anything, do you, do you sort of, is there another side to you sort of, if you drank another three Coronas or four Coronas, would you suddenly start sort of saying, well, actually there is a chance that this ends in, in, you know, real catastrophic outcomes. And, you know, do you sometimes say, well, you know, actually we are all being way, even those people who are concerned, are, you know, are you and I being, because I, I broadly see things the same way that you do. Are we being way too um, complacent? Well, um, so uh, to, to give you a literal answer to your question, there's only two things that keep me up at night. One is actually trying to do some research because, you know, my day job is managing a school and the only time I get to do any thinking or writing is between about 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Uh, and the other thing that keeps me up at night are my children. Um, so so it's, it's, I'm not being woken up by um, nightmares about uh, climate change, but, but I probably should be because... Um, you, you can hold these two thoughts in your mind at the same time, which is, one, optimistically, the combination of technology and awareness and sensitive intervention points, you know, the sort of um, uh, tipping points that we talk about in our academic work will get us to somewhere like two degrees on the one hand. And yet, on the other hand, as you rightly point out, there'll be people listening to this saying you're condemning humanity to horrific climate catastrophe, which is also... I mean, I'm not condemning anybody. I'm just trying to give a slightly ludicrous point estimate. Um, but but it is highly likely that we will have very, very serious uh, disasters to face. And the thing that I'm really worried about, probably the biggest climate-related risk, is a multi-breadbasket failure, where mm -hmm. you have climate impacts in a number of what are called breadbaskets, major crop-growing staple regions that grow what we eat around the world. You know, and you can tolerate a drought in one area in one year and a flood in another area in another year. But the risk of those events individually is rising quite rapidly. And then the risk of joint events thus rises as well. And you get a multiple breadbasket failure and then a lot of us are starving. No, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think that the, um, you know, the sort of monsoon failure type outcomes that's what really is incredibly scary um as is i think long-term sea level rise just the inexorable rise you know if we are talking you know there's a lot of focus on sort of this century and 2100 but actually i don't want um you know i don't want i don't want london to be underwater in 2200 or 2300 or 2400 um it doesn't keep me up at night but but there are some really big urgent things, as you point out, and there are also some really big long term things and the fleet feedbacks and so on. I mean, we could get on to we could do a whole other hour on how these get encapsulated or not in climate scenarios and the dreaded RCP 8.5, which tries to pretend that the long term things happen in the short term and so on. But I really strongly suggest that we don't go there. Um, I I'd agree it's with been, that. It, it's been incredibly fascinating. It's been great catching up. Um, you know, we've both been in lockdown, so uh, we haven't haven't seen you around for a, a good few months. I, I hope to again soon. Uh, we'll have another beer live, face to face, uh, and, and, and um, a socially distanced. And yeah, I'm gonna buy, and I'm going to buy a new bike as soon as I know that COVID is over and I have uh, some economic. Um, you know, as, long as, as soon as, soon as the, the pressure is off economically, I'm going to be out there. I'm going to buy a new bike and I'm going to lead you up and down those passes next time. Of course, the risk in buying a new bike is that the excuse that it's the bike goes out the window. So you've got to actually do some training then. You haven't seen the bike I've got my eyes on. All right. It may, it may have a small motor. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that outrageous. I think that's fair. You know, I'm giving, you're giving me a, you know, I've got a, a few years disadvantage. Give me a small motor and a little battery. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. And I, I, I promise <laughs> not to hide, hide a motor. Look, look after yourself. 
stay safe. Goodbye. You too. Enjoy the conversation. See you. So there you have it. The first episode of Cleaning Up, Cameron Hepburn, an extraordinary friend and an extraordinary leader in the worlds of enterprise and environment. Our guest next week on the second episode of Cleaning Up will be Rachel Kite. I've known Rachel since she was at the IFC, the private sector part of the World Bank, all the way through her time as the special representative on climate change at the World Bank, and then working uh, as the CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. We've worked very closely together. She's a great friend. She's one of the leading voices on clean energy, climate, and sustainable development. And she is now the Dean of the Fletcher School, one of the leading schools in the world on international relations. She's an extraordinary woman. It's going to be a great conversation. And I very much hope that you join us. Thank you.